All right. <coughs> Joe, <laughs> the time is upon us. I have asked if uh, Joe would share her testimony with us. So I am going to turn this over to her and let her take as much time as she needs. I just have to say for all of you to get up here without, without any notes, a big thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm prepared. Um, when Glenn asked me, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. okay. Right. When Glenn asked me to share my testimony, my first thought was my testimony is really kind of boring when I compare it to others. But he convinced me to share. He has a way of doing that. <laughs> and he's right. This is my story. And while maybe not as spectacular as some, it has made me who I am today. I was born and raised in small town USA. Mike refers to it as Mayberry. <laughs> um, my childhood was great. I lived with my older sister and my parents and was raised in a loving middle class home. My parents were and still are very hardworking people and we all attended church every Sunday. At that time, all the respectable kids also attended every Saturday morning for Saturday school, which is kind of the equivalent to the Catholic's catechism. So I was really pretty old before I even knew what Saturday morning cartoons were, never having experienced them. I was the prize student and did everything I could to have most stars on the attendance and memorization charts. And when it was filled, we each received our own Bibles. But in recollection, however, no one ever came to church carrying a Bible. And most everyone I knew kept their old family Bibles on display on the mantle. They were great for flattening on the fall leaves or for drying your flowers from your prom massage. <laughs> As I said, I loved my childhood and had great times with my family, um, swimming and camping and fishing. When we were 15, Mike and I started dating, and we knew immediately that we were supposed to be together. Mike had a good friend who, in our senior year, became very religious, sorry to make that noise, uh, which is what we always called it back then, and he started pounding us with scripture repeatedly. His heart was in the right place, but he could have been a little more tactful about it. He did succeed in planting a few seeds, though. I uh, made it through high school without participating in all the normal teenage cakers and other things as a child of the 70s, so I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was referred to more than once as Miss Goody Two Shoes. <laughs> I absolutely hated that term then, but it, now I look at it and I'm just thankful. <clears throat> um, in high school, I never felt like I fit in. I often felt like an old woman and graduated early just to escape all the teen drama. Couldn't wait to be a working woman. The next September we were to be married and three months before that Mike's older brother was killed in a construction accident while working in Missoula at the age of 29. So we all flew to Montana for the service and immediately upon meeting everyone from the church he attended I saw something I'd never seen before. Pure joy. I had never attended a funeral before where there was still peace and joy amidst all the sorrow. Being around these people for the next week convinced me that I wanted what they had. I needed what they had. I came back home to Iowa and kept busy planning our upcoming wedding. I did dig out my old Bible and began reading. I didn't even know where to begin and was embarrassed when I had to ask Mike's sister-in-law for suggestions. Me, who was the good Sunday school student, didn't know a thing about a Bible. Come September, we married, and three days later we moved to Montana. We started attending the church that Bruce and Becky had attended, and within a week I gave my heart to Jesus. They always had an altar call weekly, but I was too shy to go forward, so did it privately at our home. All my life I've been a people pleaser. That's why I'm here. <laughs> been a people pleaser and in looking back I in some weird way I think I needed to be away from my parents home in order to make my declaration of faith. It sounds really odd to say that but something made me think I'd be a huge disappointment to my mom and dad. Almost like saying they didn't do a good enough job in raising me and the faith that I was raised in. That was totally not the case. I learned so much from my parents responsibility, hard work, service to others and commitment to one spouse. I was rebaptized. I'd been baptized as an infant shortly after my salvation. And the first message we heard 
was on tithing. We'd never heard of it before, but felt like, well, we knew we needed to be obedient in all areas of our life, including financial. I remember placing a check into that little wood box and wondering how we were going to explain that to the bank when we were overdrawn. <laughs> because of the big ransom lesson or something. <laughs> the very next day, we received an unexpected check in our mailbox that covered our tithe in the exact amount needed. I have never doubted God's time to begin. We've seen this happen over and over and over many, many times. We lived in Missoula for three years, and then back to Iowa we went. We bought our first home at 22, and we started our bear paw business, young and broke. I became pregnant with Shauna, and in my 27th week, my water broke, and I also began hemorrhaging. In emergency C-section, three days later, Shauna arrived at two pounds, two ounces. Our first child, so tiny and sick. I knew what a miracle was from that day forward. We watched our baby form before our eyes. So what happens in the safety of the womb was happening on the outside. For instance, she could roll her tiny little ears. She had no cartilage. When she was three days old, she quit breathing. I remember several nurses coming into my hospital room to tell me that they had lost her, that they had miraculously been able to resuscitate her. Mike and I drew closer to God and to each other. Friends and family were there for us from day one, with rides to the hospital, meals, money, and most of all, their love and support. We were on prayer chains all over. For the next eight weeks, we made the daily 120-mile round trip to the hospital after working an eight-hour day just to spend a few precious moments with our baby. At the end of eight weeks, we brought a little four-pound miracle baby home. We felt so incredibly blessed when many others left the hospitals with empty car seats. <coughs> I am so sad by abortion, and when I see how many of our politicians vote in favor of late-term abortions, it makes me sick. At 27 weeks, our daughter would have been discarded like a piece of garbage. A few years later, Antana came along, this time a chunky, full-term baby. We came back to Montana in 1990 with two little girls this time. We were busy building a business and raising children and keeping a home. In the mid-90s, I developed some health issues which caused me daily pain, which then threw me into a deep depression. I lived through from everything, my family, my life, and even God. A dear friend asked me one day how my spiritual walk was going, and I said, it isn't. She didn't try to make me feel horrible for my honesty. She just, you know, just matter of fact said, let's get you some an antidepressant, and then we work on your relationship with Jesus. A year later, I was a new person. Physically, emotionally, off antidepressant, and most importantly, spiritually. I had my life back. Um, for the longest time, I was afraid of telling anyone that I suffered depression. Almost like I was wearing a mask of some sort. But I always felt that others would see it as a weakness. Well, what kind of Christian are you? You need to be praying more or reading a few more chapters in your Bible every day, or definitely there's a lack of faith on my part. And looking back, you know, I, I am I am not ashamed that I went through that dark period of my life. Because the Lord was there with me from day one, through it all holding my hand, and was waiting there for me when I returned to Him. I've come through it stronger than ever, and have a sensitivity to others who suffer daily. It is real, and it's not your fault. So through my life, I've seen God's hand of protection in so many situations. A few years ago, I was visiting my family and I, along with my daughter. We were in the back seat of my parents' car on our way home from dinner. It was dark, and my dad came up over a hill and we rear a tractor. It was pulling a fertilizer machine of some sort. Matthew, you would know what it was. <laughs> the vehicle had no lights or slow-moving sign on it, so it was impossible to see it. We were attached to the machine, going down the highway with the knives just inches from our windshield. The driver wasn't aware we were attached to him. We had no lights, no brakes, no horn. Our biggest fear was that some oncoming vehicle would hit us just as we were able to get loose and cross that center line. As it was, the tractor pulled into a field and we became unstuck. We, you know, looking at my dad's car, all I could see was God, and that it was only a miracle that any of us survived. So this is just one of many instances where I wake up every day and remember that each day is a gift from God. I'm filled with gratitude for everything I've been blessed with. A wonderful husband to share my life with. 
Two beautiful daughters who also love the Lord and family and friends. Most of all, I am thankful for Jesus and the promise that he has given me. And I'll just, I'm just going to end this with one of my favorite songs. It was the very first song I learned shortly after my salvation. I won't say that. I'll say it <laughs> Little by little every day, little by little in every way, Jesus is changing me. Since I've made a turnabout face, I've been growing in his grace. Oh, Jesus is changing me. My precious Jesus, I'm not the same that I used to be. Sometimes it's slow going, but there's a knowing that someday perfect I shall be. something that I, I need to clarify. Look, if I come to you and, and I ask you to come up here, you don't have to feel obligated to come up here. I did. <laughs> Josh didn't have a choice. That was part of his assignment for our discipleship class. But when, when I come and I ask you, look, if, if there is a reason that you, you just can't get up here, you're, you're not comfortable speaking in front of our with the people, whatever. Don't feel like, you know, there's any problem saying, you know, I, I really rather bow out for right now. That's, that's, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. I'm going to keep it. After you, maybe after <laughs> six months or a year, I'll ask you again, see if things have changed. But feel free at that point to tell me, no, I, I still need to wait. Right, Mike? Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But it is a blessing to get to hear other people's testimonies. So um, I, I take encouragement each time one of you gets up and shares with me. Um, so I need to apologize because um, we've started our The Essentials series. And in going through my notes and putting stuff together, I realized this week that I, I kind of messed up. I should have done this week last week and last week this week. Um, and that's, it's all Hank Anagraph's fault. <laughs> it's his fault because here I am with my pages and pages of notes and <coughs> several different saved documents that I'm pulling from and putting together and I'm trying to figure out how I can put everything together in a cohesive form to give you an outline where we're going with this. And I've got it in several different forms and you know different uh, creeds and, and different proclamations, and I thought, oh, this might be good, you know, we could do, I was, at one point I was considering doing Rich Mullins' uh, song, The Creed, um, you know, where, where he basically sings the Apostolic Creed, uh, at, at other points I was thinking of reading different um, statements, but uh, one of the links that I was reading sent me to the Hank Anagraphs page. Now, just for those of you that were curious, um, last week I did Hank Anagraphs' MAPS acronym for the Bible, how you can trust the Bible. And, and I do, I did bring it this week, and it's over there. I thought I brought it last week and realized it was still sitting at home on my printer. So that is over there. This is the anagram that we talked about. Uh, it's a lot bigger than what we discussed last week. <coughs> but it's the uh, historicity and the dependability of Scripture, the authority of Scripture. So that's over there. Well, one of the links that I was on took me back to uh, Christian Research Institute. And there, Hank Anagraph has another anagram, which I was just amazed because I thought I knew everything there was to know about Hank Anagraph. That's not true at all. Um, but there's a, a thing now. Did you give that, put it on the disc? Do you have the doctrine one? Can you put it up there for me, please? Doctrine. See, the, the essential tenets of the Christian faith we're going to talk about these things. Now, this is why I realized that I did things backwards. Because today we're going to kind of go through his outline. And this is just to give you guys an idea where we're going. Okay? Because there's absolutely no way I can cover all of this in one day. As a matter of fact, uh, last week I was actually really disappointed in the message last week. I, I really felt like I should have broken that up and done it in at least two messages. Uh, there was so much information that... Um, I just, I didn't even get a touch on. And I felt like I, I kind of 
bulleted through some things too quickly. So um, we're going to look at doctrine today. And this is Hank Anagraph's uh, anagram. D is the deity of Christ. O is for original sin. C is canon. T is trinity. R is resurrection. I is incarnation. N is new creation. And E is eschatology. Now, we're going to use this as an outline today just so you can kind of see what we're going to touch on. But I'm not going to follow this. And there's a reason I'm not going to follow this. Now, he's put it together so it's easy for us to memorize. And I think that's important. We need to be able to give a ready defense for what we believe. Okay? And if there are tricks that will make it easier, then I'm all for using those tricks. And that's the, the purpose of the anagram. Okay? Each letter represents something. And so it's easy to remember. You go, doctor, okay, D. And then you can and, and work your way through them, okay? So it's easy to learn this way. Now, after the service, if you want, I've actually printed his entire article, and I've set it on the table over here. Feel free to grab it, take a look at it, keep it with you. Um, it gives you a place to start, okay? So that's what we're doing today. We're, we're, we're getting a starting place. Now, the reason I'm not going to follow this in the forthcoming weeks is because if you look at it, there are certain things that should go together that because of the way he's got it laid out, don't. For example, uh, the deity of Christ should go right along with Trinity and Incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. So, for, for practical purposes, when we're talking about one of the essentials of the faith, when we're talking about the nature of God, we're going to put all those together. And I'm not going to break them up with things in between. <coughs> Excuse me. When we talk about original sin, we would, of course, have to follow that with new creation. So, you see why I'm not going to follow this. But this gives us a good place to start. Okay? So, let's take a look at doctrine. Um, deity of Christ. This is one of those things. I'm just going to, today, I'm really, I'm just brushing on this stuff. Okay? Today, it's like one of those, have you ever seen an artist and they paint beautiful pictures and they sit down and the first thing they do is draw some squiggly lines and some boxes and some cubes and, and things like that? And um, I have a friend, um, he's an incredible artist. Well, we worked together in Oklahoma City back in the early 90s. And on our lunch breaks, we would get on the computer and we would open up the paint program, and I would go in and I'd draw a bunch of squiggly lines and circles and squares and triangles. And then I would sit to the side of the computer and eat my lunch. Well, he was eating his lunch while I'm drawing squiggles and stuff like that. When he was done with his lunch, he would sit down and he would draw a picture out of it. He would take all my squiggles and lines, and he would make a picture out of it. Somebody riding a bike on a sunny day, or, or somebody eating dinner. And, and he was absolutely amazing to do that. Now, one of the things that they tell you when you're learning to do artwork is that you got to start off with basic geometric shapes. Everything comes down to basic geometric shapes. Okay? And so that's the first thing they do. They sketch in those shapes to get an idea where the placement of the picture is going to go. Today we're sketching. Okay? All we're going to touch on is the shapes. So the deity of Christ. We have to understand that Christ is who he said he was. Now, one of the things that, that non-believers or people of different cults will say is, Jesus never said, I am God. Well, this is where we are called to study the scriptures. Okay? Because you're right, Jesus never came out and said point blank, I am God. But he did say, the Father and I are one. And he did say, before Abraham was, I am. Now, we look at that in English, and a lot of us don't really catch, because we don't have a Hebrew background. Okay? When God was speaking to Moses through the burning bush, how did he identify himself? He gave himself the name, I am that I am. He is the great I am. The name really carries with it the idea, somebody that is eternally self-existent. Okay? He doesn't need anyone or anything. He is complete in himself for all time. Okay? So, 
When we, in our English mind, read, uh, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am, we don't understand why the Jews all of a sudden bend down and pick up rocks. We're thinking, what, because he's got some kind of longevity issue? What's up with that? Well, what he really told them, as I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, ever came to be, I was God. Okay? That's what that means. This is why we can't just go through with a light reading of Scripture. This is why God tells us that we are to study the Word to show ourselves approved. Okay? We need to study. We can't just take a little light reading. Uh, those of you that read the Daily Bread, fantastic. I hope that's not, that's just where you start, not where you end. Okay? I hope that's an encouragement to you to go further. Okay? I hope on Sundays, what I give you on Sunday is an encouragement for you to go further. All right, to get deeper into the Word, to find out these things, um, to study to show yourself approved, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. Okay, so ashamed before who? Well, ultimately before God, you know, before our Master. But but also, how about just before the body of Christ? You know, when somebody asks you a question, you go, I don't know. So what about this Trinity thing? You know, I mean, you know, the Jehovah's Witness, the, you know, they, they, there's only one God, and there can't be three parts, and that, that's heresy, and what, what about this Trinity thing? Now, a few months ago, I asked you guys to study that. We're not going to get there today. <laughs> but I want you to bring your notes, because we are going to touch on this. Because this is one of the core, essential doctrines of our faith, is the Trinity. Okay? Now, when we talk about the doctrine, the deity of Christ, we believe in the Christian church, one God, monotheism, one God, eternally existent in three parts. Okay? Now, here's where things get troublesome. See, we got finite brains. Some of us are more finite than others. <laughs> I got a really finite brain. It's really concrete and really finite. You know, if something gets in there, it's in there forever. And, and there's not a lot of room for other things, you know. The, the, the wall of my brain is curb high. But once something's on there, it's there. Okay? So, one of the things that we are not called to do is understand everything. Okay? Um, I, I often quote the t-shirt that I, I really wanted to get when I was younger. It said, if, if God were small enough to fit in your brain, he would not be big enough to handle your problems. Okay? I believe that. Quite honestly, if you've got God figured out, you're God. Okay? You don't need him because you got it all together. So, when God presents himself eternally existent in three parts, we don't have to know how it works. We have to trust the one that makes it work. Okay? Remember, we go back to um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It doesn't say without a superior intellect, without much study, without a degree in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, it is impossible to please God. It doesn't say that. It says what? Without faith. Okay? Without faith. So there are certain things in Christianity that we have to take on faith. Now, we don't have to take the principle of the Trinity, the triune God, on faith. We see that all throughout Scripture. And when we get to that in about two weeks, we're lucky we might get to it next week, you're going to be amazed at how many places the Trinity shows up throughout the Old and New Testament. Okay? Because, see, it wasn't like in that 400 years of silence that God was spending his time like an amoeba dividing up into three parts. There wasn't an Old Testament monotheistic God, and then when the New Testament came, dun, 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 boom, he broke up into three parts. That's not what happened. That's why we say he was eternally existent in three parts. The deity of Christ is the second part of that trinity. Okay? God the Son. So, he was fully man, fully God. 
So we're going we're gonna to talk about that in a minute. The deity of Christ. So that's D. O, original sin. Now, really, I, I, I understand why they say original sin, but really the, the principle comes down to sin. Okay? Because original sin, a lot of people want to take original sin and leave it with the original sinners. Adam and Eve blew it. I never ate that fruit. I don't eat fruit. <laughs> so, you know, that was their problem. Me and God are okay. But the, the principle of original sin doesn't end at the Garden of Eden. It doesn't end when Eve was tricked by the serpent and Adam was fooled by Eve. I, I, honestly, men, that sin we still commit today, one of the things that I strive for a lot, I don't like my wife to be unhappy. And that's gotten me into trouble. Because there are times when I know, don't do that. And I see my wife go, oh. And my brain just ceases working. And that, that conscience that God has put in me, God's Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, I go, not listening. And, and I do something, and, and my wife goes, yay! And then later we're like, why did we do that? <laughs> okay, we still do it. Why? You're not off the hook. Because the original sin is still at work in you as well. Now, the, the idea of original sin was not eating fruit. All right, let's, let's just clarify that. It wasn't they picked up a banana or a mango. I don't, you, you think about it. Did a pineapple have spikes then? I don't think it did. I think they, they could have just picked up a pineapple and pulled those little things on top and, and had pineapple to eat. And they didn't have to work at getting it all out. But that's irrelevant. <laughs> the point is, the fruit had nothing to do with it. What it had to do with was their obedience. Okay? Their pride. Pride came in, they committed the sin. Now, if we were to leave it right there, original sin, original sinners, their children would have been okay. But they weren't. Sin was at work in them. And, and we get into the book of Romans, and we're going to touch on this as well. We're going to find out, uh, Romans and Corinthians, we're going to find out that, that that one sin, because of Adam's sin, that propagated to every humankind that followed after. All the way down. Everybody. Now, I, I've read a lot of things, and, and quite honestly, there's an argument in the Brainiac circles. <clears throat> Does that mean that we are born sinners, or that we are just bound to sin? That there's no other choice. We will sin. I, I think both. I think we're born sinners. I think it is born in us. And I think because it is born in us, we sin. Okay? Nature, nurture. I think it's both. So original sin, I don't think was, you know, original sin, original sinners. I believe that when Adam sinned, something fundamentally changed in the construction of man... The Imago Dei, the image of God that man was created in, was corrupted. Okay? And when Adam and Eve reproduced after their own kind, they reproduced after their own kind. They were sinners. They reproduced sinners. Okay? And I believe that it affected Adam and Eve. It affected all of creation. Remember? All of creation groans. Why is it groaning if it's not affected? Really? Think about it for a minute. All right? This is just one of those things that, that boggles my brain. Did you know that lions would have no need for the teeth that they have before the fall of man? Did you know that? Why? That's right. Because before the fall of man, they didn't eat meat. They ate vegetation. Can you imagine a lion out there browsing along with a cow? That's just bizarre to me. They didn't need the canine teeth. They didn't need the ripping, tearing teeth. They needed cow teeth to grind the vegetation up. Isn't that bizarre? Isn't that bizarre? I believe that all of creation was affected because of man's pride. All right? So original sin. We're going to talk about how original sin worked its way all the way through right up to 
the second atom. Now, is original sin still at work? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It, it's still at work. Didn't you hear my grandchild? <laughs> <laughs> Going out the door? Yeah, it's, it's still at work today. Which, which actually makes another principle that we're going to talk about all that much more important. So, C, canon. Now, canon is just, it's a fancy way of saying approved writings. Agreed upon as approved. Um, we talked about this pretty extensively last week. Um, there were a number of things I didn't even get the opportunity to touch on. Uh, I might go back and, and hit on that again to, to clarify it, but um, quite honestly, there's so much information on there, I, it would be overload. Okay, if I were to try and present it all in one shot, it would just be overload. I know when, uh, the, 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 actually I've been looking at this entire series for months, and I have to sometimes take a break and go, wow, I just, it, it's not making any sense to me anymore. It's just oozing out my ears. And that's an ugly sight. So, but, but I, there's so much there that God is so faithful to showing us that we can trust his word. Now, one of the things I didn't touch on last week that I want to touch on just briefly this week, the canon of Scripture. We talked about how a lot of cults want to corrupt the canon of Scripture and say that, you know, at some point in the history, from when it was written to when their inspired writing came, our inspired writings got corrupted. Okay? Sometimes they say, oh, the Middle Ages, sometimes the early. Some of them even have the audacity to go back and say, well, when they first put the canon together, they only put in the things that their particular belief wanted. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to address to you. One, see one. <laughs> one. Um, when they came together, uh, there were actually three different councils where they agreed on the canon of the New Testament. See, the canon of the Old Testament is never called into question. That's been established for so long that nobody really even looks at it and goes, oh yeah, you know, um, Deuteronomy, that shouldn't be there. Or, you know, Nahum. I mean, really, who needs Nahum? Really? That doesn't, but there, that's never even in question. But the, the canon of the New Testament is in problem because they, the people always want to question, they want to tear it down. And, and what, what's really interesting, we see that in Hollywood. <coughs> Do you ever notice in Hollywood that it's okay to say God, but as soon as you say Jesus, ooh, ooh, my. Because see, God can represent anything. I mean, you, you, God can, I mean, there's all kinds of gods out there. We know all kinds of them that are out there, and, and they're all false. There's only one true God, but as long as we say God, it can be anything to anybody. But as soon as you say Jesus Christ, that's a problem, because there's only one. And that's when they go, and you're like, oh, no, 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 freedom for everyone, but not that. Everybody has the opportunity to say whatever you want, but you've got to shut up. Okay? For whatever reason, Jesus Christ is an offense. Uh, scripture tells us that. Remember, it, it, what does it say? It's a stench. A stinky odor. Okay? So, the first thing that I want to share with you is that when they brought the canon together, there were a number of principles that they established to whether or not it was included as canon. The first of those was, was it inspired of God? Okay. Was it inspired of God? Second, was the writer a man of God? Okay. Was the writer a man of God? Third, and this is the one that, that trips up all those that bring things into question. Is this accepted by the church as having met the first two conditions. Okay? So when the council came together, it wasn't like a group of six guys got together over beer and pizza, or wine and matzah, or <laughs> euro bread, or whatever, and, and just decided, hey, you know what, let's just make up a list. Because what, what's interesting is in the first canon of scripture of the New Testament, there were three books that were not included. Did you know that? The book of Hebrews, the book of James, and the book of 2 Peter. They, they were not included in the original canon of Scripture. But they were asked to be included, and when they came down to it, there were some current concerns, uh, different concerns for each one. The book of Hebrews, they weren't really sure who wrote it. We're still not really sure who wrote it. And for that reason alone, it was decided we, we probably should hold off on this one. 
okay? Uh, the book of James. Actually, did you know that the book of James, um, Martin Luther did not want the book of James in the Bible. He disliked it. Why? Because if you read the book of James, it, it gives you the indication that you might be able to be saved by works. Well, if you read it honestly, that's not what he's saying. Uh, actually, what James says is perfectly in line with what 1 John says and perfectly in line with what Paul says in Ephesians. Okay? We're saved by grace through faith, but we're saved unto <coughs> works. The works follow after. And that's James' point. He says, look, you say you're saved? Good. What are the works that prove your salvation? Not the works that prove you know, that you, you, you work unto salvation, but the works that come as a result of salvation. Okay? And then, quite honestly, I have not found a good reason why they didn't, they didn't want... Second Peter. I, I can't, I could never figure it out. But, you know, uh, approximately 22 years later, they reconvened. They reconvened the council, and then about seven years after that, they had a third council. In the second and third council, all the members agreed that those three books should be put and included in the canon of Scripture. Now, the only reason I tell you this is so you'll understand a very important point. Never has a book been removed from Scripture. Okay? And that's important because that's one of the things that a lot of cultists will want to tell you. They want you to believe that they took things out that we had to put back in. Okay? That this, this new revelation that we have is important because of what was taken out of Scripture. So from about 360... A to today. The canon of Scripture has not changed. Now, we talked last week about the number of manuscripts that are from that time that we can go back and look at the same manuscripts that they had, and we can see that it's the, 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 the core of Scripture, the, what the Scripture says, is exactly the same as what they had. So, no point in the history of Scripture can we get a point where there was a the things disappeared and we had to come up with a new one. The, the, the Bible was insufficient. The things fell out. They lost things. So we had a new one. And, and we won't even get started on the guys that brought forth the new one. Okay? Because quite honestly, if, if you are intellectually honest, it's so incredibly easy to tear apart their lies. It's, it's, it's actually embarrassing. Okay. So, canon of Scripture. We can trust God's Word. So, moving on. Trinity. Ah, ooh, that's a good one. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the Trinity. Because this is a doctrine you have to understand. It's not... You can go, oh yeah, yeah, I believe the Trinity. Really? Why? Because you said so. <laughs> Because, you know, my Sunday school teacher told me I had to. Otherwise, I wouldn't get the gold star. But did you know that God is faithful in giving us what we need to understand? Okay? He's faithful. And He's consistent. Okay? And we're going to talk about that. Because one of the first things that you're going to hear people say is, Oh, the Trinity! That word is nowhere in the New Testament or the Old Testament. You're right. You're right. But that's okay. Because neither is rapture. But we're going to talk about that too. Okay? So, Trinity. We're going to talk about one God eternally existent in three parts. Okay? And not three gods. We're not going to talk about tritheism, where we have God the Father, who is a completely separate body, soul, and spirit being, God the Son, who is completely separate from the Father as body, soul, and spirit, and God the Holy Spirit. Would he have a body? <laughs> <laughs> However that works. But believe it or not, that is a very popular teaching. As a matter of fact, I've, uh, in the last about eight years, I saw a very popular uh, TV evangelist put forth that theory, that heresy. Okay? So we're going to talk about Trinity, triune theology. Uh, resurrection. As a Christian, you got to believe this. Okay? Um, as a matter of fact, I firmly believe that you have to believe in the physical 
resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we're not going to stop with just the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because as a result of that, we also believe in the resurrection of the saints. Those of us that get to call him Father. Okay? The resurrection. Why is that important? Well, because if we don't believe the resurrection, then we go into the grave and that's it. Or if we believe in, well, you know what, I'm already, I, I don't want to get too far into this. Um, you know, because some people go, oh, it was just a spiritual resurrection. How many of you put your finger in the side of a spirit? <laughs> Not me. Um, how many of you have actually got to touch them? How many, how many spirits do you know sit down and eat? Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to talk about all of that. Um, incarnation. This goes right back to the Trinity. Because this talks about God coming to earth, taking on the form of man, being fully God and fully man. Should I do that? <laughs> My wife's making fun of me. We had a professor in school that could not say that phrase without going like this. Fully God, <laughs> fully man. <laughs> okay. um, now, this again, this, now, I want you to understand, there are going to be some things that I can't give you the whys and the wherefores. I can just show you the scriptures that point this out. Okay, I don't know how God did it. He didn't deem me necessary to that conversation. He didn't deem you necessary to that conversation. This is one of those areas where we go by faith. Now I can show you the scriptures that show that he is absolutely God and absolutely man. One at the same time. Okay? And we're going to talk about that. The incarnation. That this being, this heavenly being, actually I'm going to rephrase that because, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are people that believe that Jesus was a heavenly being, but he wasn't God. He was either um, the archangel Michael or was the offspring of God. We believe that he was fully God. He was one-third of the Trinity come to earth in, in human form. Okay? So, um, new creation. I, I can't wait till we talk about that one. Because that is something that is the hope that we have. Okay? We, we see the incarnation. We're going to talk about um, the, the death and resurrection. But, you know, there was a reason for that. God didn't just get bored one day and say, you know, I have always wondered what it felt like to be hung on a cross. But that's okay, because I can just bring myself back. That, you know, that, that wasn't the case. God had a plan. Scripture tells us that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So when God created the world, it was already determined that Jesus would die. Okay? The purpose for that was that we might be redeemed, that we might be new creations. As a matter of fact, um, in, in John chapter 3, when Jesus is, is talking with the Pharisee, and he says, uh, you know, you have to be born again. Well, he couldn't understand that. He's like, well, what do you mean? Do I enter into the womb a second time? He said, no, you have to be born of water, and you have to be born of spirit. Okay? The new creation that we have is, is something that the world doesn't have, and they, they can't understand, because they don't have it. You know, um, they just, they, it, it, it's unfathomable to them. They, they don't get it. And to try and explain it to them without them having God's Spirit to instruct them to open up those locked areas of their mind, it doesn't work. They just get frustrated. Because it's like you're speaking a different language. You know? And you know we have a different language in the church, right? We talk about things like um, repentance. What? We, we talk about confession. Confession, dude, I didn't do nothing. Well, yeah, just by your expression there, you did. You completely butchered your English teacher's instructions. <laughs> but, you know, we, we have this language that we use in here, and that's something that I really, I work hard to try and overcome because we use these words and we throw them out. We understand what they mean because we use them. But when new people walk in here and they go, they, I didn't understand half of what he said. All right? So, new creation. We become new creation. Now, what I am today is radically different than what I was before he saved me. But, but, 
what I am today is nothing compared to what I'm going to be when he comes back. Okay? So, we're going to talk about being a new creation in Christ. Okay? Eschatology. Now, I think this one is absolutely fitting that it comes at the end. Eschatology, that's one of those words that we use. It's a fancy way of studying uh, what you think is going to happen at the end of things. It's the study. Ology, O-L-O-G-Y, means the study of something. And eska means end times. Okay? And every one of us has an eschatological view. Boy, wasn't that fancy? We all have an idea of what we think is going to happen at the end. Okay? And the, the point that we're going to talk about, we're, we're not going to, you know, all, uh, people are getting all excited. Oh, yeah, you know, we're going to millennial this and tribulation that. No, not really. Because, see, what we're going to talk about is what we know He has promised. Okay? And, and there's actually quite a few things that we know that He's promised that refer to the end times. One... He's coming back. He's coming back to claim his own. Okay. Once he has claimed his own, those that are not his own will also be sorted. Okay. And we're, we're going to talk about these things, but it doesn't end there. You know, that's kind of like the beginning of the end. Um, I remember in uh, World War II when we were studying World War II um, the Germans were doing the bombing of England and this went on for days and days and days and days and the uh, British Air Force was finally able to beat off the German Luftwaffe and, and the bombing stopped and somebody was talking with Winston Churchill and uh, they said, you know, are we now seeing the beginning of the end? He said, no, we're not seeing the beginning of the end, but perhaps we've seen, we've seen the end of the beginning. Okay. Right now, we want to talk about being at the beginning of the end. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I see more scripture fulfilled today than I have seen in a long time, but quite honestly, I see more scripture fulfilled in World War II than I see today. But I see some important ones fulfilled today that weren't fulfilled in World War II. Now, what I do know is, every day, I am one day closer. Every day, one day closer. Um, see, I don't have to know the time. As a matter of fact, when I think I know the time, I know I'm wrong. Because he's told me that. So don't get caught up in your timelines, you know, because God has his plan, and, and thankfully, he's got that in control. He doesn't need my help. Okay. All I know is he is coming back. And we'll talk about some of the scriptures. We're actually going to talk about some of the ideas. The, the, we might even touch on some of the merits and some of the, the problems with some of the ideas. And, and I'm going to talk about some of the ones that are just outright wrong. Okay. So, the deity of Christ, the original sin, canon, trinity, resurrection, incarnation, new creation, eschatology. Now at the bottom there, I, I did put the uh, website that I got that. Um, the document is over there, and in each of these, he actually goes in information. He lists scripture, why we believe this. These are the scriptures that would indicate this. Uh, we're, this is what we're going to be talking about over the next, I don't know how long, quite honestly. I look at a particular subject. Um, you know, I've got it broken down in a, in a little bit different way. But, you know, one of the things that I, I want to talk about is the nature of God. Okay? That's something that is an essential belief to the Christian faith. What is the nature of God? But included in that, we have monotheism. We have the Trinity. We have the Incarnation. We have the Resurrection. And, and how I squeeze all of those into one week, I don't think I can. Not be coherent. Okay? So, this is the beginning. This is where we're starting. Uh, I, like I said, I blew it. I, I already did canon last week. Quite honestly, I think that's the first one we have to deal with. Why? Why do we have to deal with canon? Because if you can't trust his word, you can't trust anything that we're going to go to from his word. Okay? And all of that becomes suspect. 
Okay? But if we can trust His Word, if we can trust that when we open the Bible, we are getting the <coughs> Word of God, and there isn't stuff that's been taken out and stuff that's been stuffed in to fulfill a particular theology, <coughs> if we can trust that, then we know that what we actually read out of there is truth. Okay? God is so incredibly faithful in giving us what we need. All right? He has protected His Word. He has cared for His Word. There have been more attempts at destroying the Bible than any other book. As a matter of fact, one of the, the resources that I looked at said every other book, every other book combined. That's how hostile the world is to His Word. Okay? So, um, let's close in prayer. Father, we bless